welcome to Joseph's Model Railway and Toy Room. And in today's episode, we are talking about laying down some track. As seen in previous videos, of course, we have laid the cork foundation, at least on the uh, Dad's Army loop that we're working on. And we've got a bit of super elevation happening here. So the next thing is we need to get the track attached down. Uh, in this video, we're going to be using copy decks. And join me now for a bit of an exciting ride. Well, for some 37 years, we come to the moment I've been dreaming about. The single most exciting part about building a model railway. The track laying. Just like this chap here. Thoroughly enjoying a magnificent room. Probably a wonderful hi-fi in the background. Beautiful day outside in an insulated room. He's even got the track planning edition as well. He's done his homework and that steel ribbon looks incredible there. Whether it be the new track plans, whether it be the old track plans, attention to detail, even teaching you how to build everything from your framework to doing the electrical. Nothing's really changed. Track geometry and all the rest. Oh, I love it. Here he is with his son, building what is the ultimate layout from the 1978 Hornby catalogue. As we wait on more deliveries so we can get those key viaduct sections completed across the layout. Hold your breath now. Oh yes indeed. It's time to start laying some track. Been waiting for this bit. Unfortunately I've got a I'll start with these curves of course um, and that section going down we can get started with that. We finally have our copy decks glue that we'll talk about going on with that plus a little bit of electrical work. Again, this isn't a wiring video, but just point out what we're gonna be up to. So let us swing the camera around just for a moment and focus on what needs to be done now. We have our three lines here. I've also taken the time to just take a pen and mark this out for what I'm doing. So I know, yep, this is definitely where we're going to be attaching the track. And there's nothing really stopping us. We know the points are going to be here, give or take a fraction which we can gently move accordingly, but at least uh, we can start laying track from this point forward around and then match it up and smooth it all out as we go once we have the turnout motor installed. The concern obviously I just have is where the one needs to sit for uh, the secondary point over here is there is a beam underneath that's close to it. It shouldn't make contact. Uh, by the time we sort of slot it and under, we're probably going to miss everything, but we want to make sure we get all of this right. The reason I point this out brings us back to the whole idea about the trap door. As I said, there's an invisible line running against here, which is where the cabinet work is, and everything on this side of the board we can climb under and get easy access to. To try and overcome this, we're obviously going to need to add a dropper here. It's a practical place to be because we've got a fair bit of distance. We're going to a meter and a half. It's pretty fair. Even if I do put a dropper straight in at the other end, we're still covering a fair distance. So we come to our little trap door and these little beauties I've knocked together. I bought the Pico um, power feed joiners. So they're basically you get uh, they're expensive enough at $15. You only get four black ones and four red ones. Um, but it's just a rail joiner that's already had it soldered on. There's going to be a lot of criticism here. I can already see it now from people saying, should attach to the track, should attach to the track. And yes, that is where we're going to solder it to. The theory in this, and you can see what I've done. I've just soldered them all together because we've got three tracks, three blacks, three reds. I also just took enough lead that we'll be able to sweep this out of the way for you. Pop our trap door open here. And wouldn't you know it, the hole's in the wrong place because I'm going to have to come in on this side. So I'll probably just bang a hole through here. That's just meeting my friend Mrs. Murphy again. We'll take these and we're going to drill the holes and come in and go under. And the whole idea about using these rail joiners, I was thinking, is that by the time we make contact, we're at least doing our best to not just electrify one section of track. We're going to electrify this section and that section to give us a fair sweep. I don't see there should be any complication in doing this. Again, with my previous Hornby layout, there was just the standard Hornby track feeder and that was a two and a half loop setup. 
that I never had one problem anywhere on that layout. Power was consistent everywhere. So in which case, this is a quarter of the size, half the size at least of what I had before with one feeder. And there's a likelihood that we'll have feeders here. We'll have some during all the point work here, probably picking one up somewhere over here again, but as we come up and down on the ramp from here. So let's be sensible. I think we're going to be just fine. And I thought by putting these in and having them sort of uh, done in the Pico manner that this is a, a very, very well put together uh, solder and a join they do together there, very professional. We link them off, we put them in, and there's no reason we should ever have to touch this again. But as mentioned, if we do, we can bust our little door open, we can come under, do whatever needs to be done. And since I don't have all my tools with me at the moment and it's the middle of the night and I don't feel like walking down to the shed, I think this drill bit's probably a wee bit on the larger side, but at least we have a drill handy. So back to another day of disasters of which it was. We've got our hole in over here, but I got a bit wild when it came through. I didn't realize how close it was and I've gouged this out. Of course, then I needed to put a hole in here in case we interconnect something back and forth as there might be some form of scenic lighting. And that turned out to be a little bit of a howdy doody. But if we've learned anything, we've got the right drill bit to get these holes drilled in there. Again, I'm gonna come back to this um, wiring in a later video, but you've got to obviously stay consistent with however you're going to be doing this. Now, traditionally, uh, there's a lot about uh, people who will use red for the right, which makes sense, and then black for the left. Wait, what did you say? Here's a top view of a piece of track. So we're saying that this will be the left and this is the right, Okay, I understand that, but we're not putting a strip of red wire here and black wire here. It's here or it's here. In other words, from this view, is it the top? Is it the bottom? Okay, well, let's get down and be practical. Can't get much closer than this, can we? Looking down now, looking toward the outside where the windows are. Now we can identify pretty simply and say that, well, in this case, Left, right. Okay, hang on a minute. Let's just take our camera. 180 degree turn here. Sitting back down on that same piece of track. And you're telling me that it's going to be left, right. Even though in the other picture we just said that. So understanding orientation. That's why for me, as we come back out of this scenario, that can be a little bit confusing because when we come in and look at track, am I looking this way? Of which case we have the right and then the left, or am I looking this way? And in which case we have the left and the right. So I just wanted to point out though about the theory, as I said, uh, just regarding black and red, my theory was red to red, in otherwise red faces toward the end of the um, framework or the frame of our layout here, which is red. So that seemed like a, a logical move. And then I was going to call black to track. In other words, if the black is sitting on the inside, then it's facing toward track, facing toward track. And again, as the loop curls around, the what is the inside of track faces back to the track. So black to track, red to red. Now that's just my situation. I've seen in a lot of uh, magazine articles and YouTube videos and that that they use red to right. I am completely confused by this. Told you that was a good idea. Next problem is, is that hole big enough to allow for the shrink wrap and the join to go through? And it's not, of course. I don't mind sticking by that. Three mil is the correct size hole for this to happen. Of course, the wire would come up and we'd solder it to the track accordingly. Just because of those track feeders in that particular instance, we're obviously going to need to just step up to a slightly bigger hole. So I'll just run up to a four mil. Of interesting note here, the four mil hole is what we use uh, in the video I did about the power um, to do the IPA studs that I put into the, into the sockets there. Would they recommend a four mil hole? Well, it's been 
been six hours and I can tell you it's been a complete and utter waste of time or is it just a practical learning curve? Well, we shall see. I've never used this copy deck stuff before. I am going on the fact that uh, after uh, what is now 100 videos, uh, Charlie from Chadwick Railways highly recommends going this way and mostly for an acoustical benefit. I like the idea that we get a reasonably quick sort of grab down with it and we can move it around and set it down. So let's see how we go. I also like the fact that it's more of a type of a rubber based thing, almost like a silicon. So I get that it's going to have that sort of smoother, quieter operation. But let's see what's going to happen. Now, flex track is always a bit of an interesting one and we're obviously arcing around a pretty big uh, curve here. I must admit this is where I take my hat off to set track and to be fair going on this outer radius here which was fourth radius half of it at the moment sitting in there is set track and with a little bit of uh, uh, play here and there left and right I think we can just keep that and put it in this one a bit more trickier so what I have done um, I've taken a little drill and just in, well, particularly where we're going to make the join, I'll put a couple of little little hole here, hole here, hole here, hole here, and then just a couple in the middle of some sleepers as we go along to use these little Pico screws. Whoops. And hopefully you can see that. Or not. So the whole idea is we're going to slap this copy decks down and set the track down, which will still give us room to play and make sure we've got a nice seamless join here. And then we're going to use these screws to screw it in and hold it in place. Never done it before. Let's see what happens. I've already had enough challenges. Now the situation I'm having, because I'm literally doing two sections of flex track here, one that's going to bend this way and the other one bending in the opposite way. So I'm already against the eight ball. So my theory is we're just going to glue this half down and lock it down, even with the screws, to get a nice permanent bond, so to speak. And then what we're going to do is lay the other one down where we should be able to slide and feed straight into those fish plates. I must admit the other thing about using the, these Pico pre-wired ones is the plate is quite loose how this is going to join up with the plates and the wire. So I think the best thing is I'm going to probably just bring the glue to about here. Uh, the other thing is obviously we're going to have a gap that we're going to need to slide some spare sleepers into in time. Um, and from what I've seen, people take them, then file them off and then slide them under. I'm probably overthinking it a little bit because it's true. Once the ballast comes down, you really, it just blends all as one. But uh, I'm actually someone that thoroughly just enjoys seeing a piece of track exactly as it is. You know, I could have just painted the board or, as with the Hornby track map, lay the track map down and put the track on top. Here we are. I better man up and get on with this and stop procrastinating. All right, let's slap this glue down and see what happens. Again, this glue ended up coming to us from the UK. Um... So hopefully we can get a bit of a bit of mileage out of it um, because I'll obviously need at least a four to six week headroom before we, if we're going to need to order more with the delays with freight. So we have popped this uh, copy decks down. I've checked to make sure everything is exactly where it should be. Again, I'm just doing one section because I, I just don't know about this at the moment. But look, it's sitting there. It's uh, The screws are doing an excellent job. I'll give that 10 out of 10. Although, I must say, by the time I've gone in and on the super elevation here, obviously it wants to bend and flex. Um, I don't have a problem with the doing the outside bit, but the middle bit, it's already bent that sleeper a bit. Again, the ballast, I know, but still... I don't know about this. I mean, otherwise, what the heck is just wrong with using set track and there's a hole already in it, screwing it down. I'm not 100% convinced, but well, let us carry on. We'll put this in, leave it, come back later. I'm not investing more time and product until I'm convinced. Again, we're going to do this loop following this method. 
Well, that's been some eight hours. It's not the next day, just later in the evening. So um, it's probably still curing at the moment. It's interesting, according to the uh, label, and I may have done this wrong, so I apologize. Uh, we're supposed to liberally put it on. So as mentioned, I will need more of this. Uh, we're meant to wait 15 to 20 minutes for it to become touch dry and then put it on. Um, well, we might try that in some other areas, but I think at the moment I'll stick with the old school way, put it on and keep it weighted down and just let it bond. It seems to be a reasonable bond to the track. It's, it is it is solid. I'm, I'm not going anywhere with it. Uh, I've removed those other screws out of the track. Uh, but if we just come in on a section where I had one, here's one over here. I'm really not too impressed with that. So I'm not sure what I'm going to do. At least if we come over where I did it over here and you'll notice I had put the screw in on the ends of the sleepers here. I don't think that's too bad, knowing that we will have the ballast um, coming across the shoulder there. Still, I'm really not too impressed with that. I think if we can just get it in the right position and honestly, I'd really just prefer to be using the traditional type of... Um, pins and keeping in place if it's going to stay tacky. We'll proceed and keep trying a few things. I guess the important thing is now that at least I've got it solidly down, now I can start joining up and doing the rest. And in which case our next gadget we're going to be using to allow this to happen smoothly so we don't get any dog legs is we come back to using a track setter or as I had with the Hornby thing, uh, we're going to use these radiuses which will lock in and hold. Let's have a look at that. Crikey, I salute you people doing this flexible track prior to having templates like this to hold it. It's no easy feat, I'm not going to lie. As I said, this is my first time stepping out of the set track arena. Um, and of course, as I said, we're starting on the hardest bit first. I know the rest won't be so bad, even those two corners we go around, but... It's not easy getting it in that right spot and sitting it. And yes, it's a tight curve, but as I said, we've checked it's going to work. So I've locked them in place here. Uh, the inner rail's nicely joined. Again, we need to point this out. This room is a fairly regulated temperature. This isn't like having it in a shed or an attic that's going to be exposed to getting into single digits of temperature and the expansion and contraction on the track. So I can be pretty tight with things here. That's not going to be a problem as others need to factor in. I've slapped this copy decks down and as you can see, the focus is the track's angling. It's really going to make contact on the angle that it's being lifted on and the lower side. So it's kind of what I'm up to over here. I've put it down, it's been down for probably five minutes now. We'll just start putting it on anyway. Um, as I said, these curves are a bit tricky. I get the point in having to put a few anchor screws in at either end, but look, I, I'm just not happy with that at all. I suppose that's the thing about this and I why I come back to that picture in the older catalogue was the simplicity. The Hornby system, you put their track down, their set track and away you went. And when you're working with the flexible on the serious modelers, they're not going to work on curves that are quite as wild as this necessarily. But this track has now been laid. It's glued and dried and firmly in place. We just need to do the next two. But I just wanted to say one of the greatest tools I can find, and I've stuck by it for years, is to use soda cans to weight it down. It's just the right amount of weight that comes down. Remember, these are sitting on plastic sleepers. Um, so if you come in and people use weights and lots of books and things, if you're not even with weight distribution, you can end up causing a situation where things can bow and flex up in sections. And we uh, we really don't want that sort of effect happening. So it's always nice, consistent. Yes, it's got weight, but nothing that's too unreasonable. And what's magnificent is the fact that 
you can see how easily and nicely it sits in the track, whether it's curved or not. Was laying this curve in flex track a good idea? Definitely not. First of all, for any of you that have worked trying to create some rather tight curves using flex track, you'll know it can be a bit of a bother. So much so, I don't mind telling you that as we can see, what happened here with the sleepers? It gets bumped as it comes down. They've lost a little bit of the exact thing. Again, once it's ballasted, you're not really looking, but it's not ideal. Secondly, the whole idea about using it was to maximize the use on this available space to basically achieve the greatest radii I could use for smoother operation. Always knowing that using second radius was always going to fit. Of course, I have a, uh, this is a second radius um, template that I use. Um, and actually, if we slide it into the rails now and just slide it around the track work, you will see that whole curve is basically second radius until it just fans out open at the end there. This here, would you believe it, is second radius. So, of which I have enough to do two sets of loops with. Why didn't we use it? I don't know, but I really wish I would have stuck with that now. It would have saved a lot of time and a lot of frustration. I guess the idea of using that flex track is it does give it that really sort of seamless sort of look. Uh, it's come, it's come up nicely now that it's all been said and done, but it was a lot of time to get there and uh, I wouldn't recommend it. If you're in a position arming and ahhing going flex track, if you're going a bit bigger on the curves, yes, use it. The, uh, and look, the third one, I don't think we'll have half as many problems, but coming in any tighter, and goodness knows if you were trying to do a first radius in flex track, you can throw that in the bin now. I wouldn't even try to attempt that. Looks good. Okay, for the purpose of this demonstration, we'll remove this section of track. Again, we've still got to fix this section down. Let us just spend a moment and focus on the fact that we now have this section of track uh, laid. So we've got some super elevation on the curve. We have used our copy decks to secure it down. Plus, we also have the track feeders here to give us some electrical power, which I'd like to also just make a quick mention here that when we did the original demonstration a few videos back on the outer loop where I didn't even have my cables attached to the track, we just used a few bits of metal, if you'll recall, and lent the wire on there, I was running that entire locomotive all the way down to the fiddle yard, which is enough reason to sort of say, we don't have to get that carried away with track feeders necessarily, as long as the track is well joined. Okay, enough of that now. Let's talk about the end result and really as a conclusion, I guess more than anything, I've already given you my opinion about what I thought about doing this, but I just wanted to bring the microphone, I've just got the microphone beside me um, and you've got this access to it. So we just have our standard, again this is a 70s series um, British Rail Hornby uh, Intercity Coach. Um, there's really nothing too fancy about this is the one I've been using for testing everything at the moment. Uh, made in Great Britain, that's something we don't see a lot of these days anymore, but that is the case. Um, and of course we've got the metal wheels on it as well. Um, and it's uh, certainly not anything fancy, it's not a buffet or a sleeper or mail coach or anything, it's pretty stock standard and unfortunately during all of my testing and the alike of doing all this it's become the usual one because I accidentally um, had the marker and I accidentally marked the top of it. Uh, I don't really want to try removing it, especially with one of these Milwaukee inks all everything because trying to do it may start lifting paint and causing a problem. I've got plenty of these coaches, so let's just leave it there and leave it on the board as the test one. Okay, now let's put it on the track. I guess the most important thing is the whole idea, and I go back to Charlie from Chadwick Model Railway for doing his videos, was he's using this copy decks, and again, he's using the foam as well as opposed to cork. I like the cork because it's tried and tested. This stuff just 
will last until the day I die if it's sitting here. So that's why I've gone this way with it. Um, the foams, the early ones did break down. If anyone's used the Hornby ones in the past, it did. I understand, I believe it's Woodland Scenics now, what have you, make a product that's fantastic. But I'm just not convinced. And I don't have easy access to it anyway, so cork it is. So the whole idea is there's no track pins anywhere. This is officially just glued down now. And acoustically, it's the way to go. I'm going to stop talking, believe it or not. Let's just glide this coach over it. It's not that really that that quiet now, is it? I mean, even if I'm running a, a local, say a reasonable type of a speed, as an example, and there'd probably be four or five coaches on here. That's the noise we're dealing with. Just to give you another example, if I swing our camera around, turn some additional lights on here, and I've got the microphone just located just on the side here. This is just a standard piece of Hornby straight track, which I've just temporarily on this piece of cork that's been laid. Um, just popped a couple of pins in as if we've basically put track pins down into the bore. The pins are penetrating the cork and they're going down into that plywood. Let's just pop a coach on here. I'll stop talking again. If anything, I find that a bit more quieter to tell you the truth. Again, that's not a curve, so it might not be as accurate. So in conclusion, here we are commencing the track laying and we've still got a lot more track to get laid but let's recap on what's happened i understand there's a little delay now i've got i couldn't continue i wanted to show two loops completed um unfortunately this is as far as i've come on using one loop literally from point to point is exactly where we've ended up um it's beyond my control with deliveries and the rest that I've got to correct the point situation, but that's okay. The formula is going to be the same. You're not going to miss much here. I'll carry on. Is this worth doing? Truthfully, no. I really don't have any problem whether you want to nail your... I have no problem with gluing the track down. I thought that was that was fine once you've sort of, uh, sort of got it set down. It sits nicely. As for using the copy decks... It's a fine enough product if you've got easy and cheap enough access to it, but honestly, I can't see any difference whatsoever, acoustically or otherwise, using copy decks versus a PVA glue, especially when the ballast goes down. I, I still, uh, for someone that understands a bit about acoustics, that's no. And with the foam, absolutely, you'll, you'll get a benefit from it. But uh, uh, we're talking about some pretty minute little decibels of sound to be silenced there. Taking a page from my hi-fi channel, I was actually going to come in with an instrument testing microphone and uh, connect it to a real-time analyzer and show you the difference between tapping on a piece of track that's on the ply, tapping it with the copy decks, and with track that's just going straight onto the cork. To save people hassle and all the rest of it, the benefit of trying to go for that acoustical thing, if that's a big deal for you, so be it. It's not for me. I've got this dedicated room. I'd rather spend more money and time investing in good acoustics into my hi-fi than on this situation. Another point I'd like to quickly share with you is I'm not a big fan on sound locomotives. I understand the realism. I've got a few fantastic stuff. I think we all know that without a uh, correct size speaker box and getting the right air movement going, it sounds tinny, it sounds this and that. Look, they're making leaps and bounds as we go along, and that's fantastic. But uh, I've found it personally a little bit cheesy. I don't get all that excited. Um, for some people, they do. It's not a big thing for me. And just hearing the rake of train sweeping around the layout as it's going, I always think it's kind of like having the red light in a recording studio lit. Um, oh, there's business happening in there, things are happening. And when I can hear the swirl of trains whizzing by and I come past the room, that's a good sign. It means someone's in this room playing and having a good time. That's the sound I really want to enjoy. So silencing it isn't a big deal. I've tried it this way. I'm not happy with it. We're, like I said, we'll carry on to where we've got, 
but uh, there's a high chance with the rest of the layer. And also, I guess it's pulling it up later as well. We'll talk about that as we go on. I think we might change our tactic as we carry on. We'll finish this with copy decks in this loop at least, and uh, then we'll reevaluate as we carry on. But at the moment, no, that's busted. If you've just picked up yourself a set of track pins or those Pico track screws, which I found quite good, if you're using Hornby track, which has already got the holes ready to go in it, stick with it. It's an absolute winner. I have no problems at all. And as I said earlier in the video, knowing what I know, I would have been more than happy to just stick with set track, which is what I said from the beginning I wanted to do. But here we are, we're committed at the moment. Let's just carry on and see how things go. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that now concludes this video. We obviously have some track laid and because of delays with current world events, we'll get some more laid shortly once we've got our points sorted out. In the meantime, thanks so much for watching again. You don't have to subscribe and follow and do any of that. I'm just bringing the videos to you when I can. Hope you enjoy. We'll see you in the next one. Stay safe. Toodles.